Uh, Filippo, uh, thank you so much for your for your time today. Um, I've been very much looking towards this conversation. There are many, many uh, topics that I hope that we have the uh, the time to to cover. My first question would be just a very simple question, and perhaps not a simple question at all. Why the art of fugue? Well, it is not an easy uh, question. Um, I would have to say, first of all, why do I choose any particular piece? What is it that motivates me? And uh, usually it's a, a mixture of two things. Uh, one is at, at some point a piece is calling to me. Uh, so I, I will feel that it is time to to put my hands on the work, to analyze, to think about it, to do something with it. Uh, and this is something that is not, I, I cannot rationalize why at some point it should be the art of fugue and at another it should be a Beethoven sonata or Chopin piano pieces. Uh, it's something that probably is influenced by whatever happens around me, by whatever happens inside me. Uh, but at some point I just feel with a certain um, with, with certainty that this is the time to, to start working on a certain piece of music. And then the other thing is usually I, I feel a sort of, of mission uh, uh, that a piece needs an opportunity to be heard by the audience um, in a certain way or that I can do something with it that hasn't been done before. And this is a, is a very powerful mo motivator to put in hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of work or even thousands, even on a single piece of music and, and trying to then spread it as much as possible to people uh, in live concerts and recordings and so on. So why the art of few? Uh, my first approach to this work was when I was 18 and I was studying piano and conservatory in a medium-sized city in Italy, Bergamo. And in Italian conservatory, we also need to study harpsichord for two years. Uh, I was a terrible harpsichord player, or at least I consider myself quite a terrible harpsichord player. But I was very lucky in that my teacher was Sergio Vartolo who is, uh, as a scholar and as a performer, quite a leading authority on the art of fugue, and who has actually recently published uh, in Italian a new monography on the art of fugue, of which he uh, asked me to write the, the, the back cover, which for me was a huge honor. And during the, these two years of uh, harpsichord studies, he suggested that I should start working on the art of fugue because he loved the piece, he knew it very well. He could see that I uh, could work well with counterpoint, that it was something I enjoyed. And somehow he passed on to me the feeling that people always talk about the art of fugue as something, something completely abstract, mathematical, that has nothing to do with the, the human heart or feelings. And actually, this is just not true. And when I started working on, on these pieces and, and listening to them uh, properly and, and just playing this music, suddenly I, I felt the, the same as he did, that this music is extremely powerful on every sort of level, uh, including and maybe even foremost, the emotional one, the impact it, it can have on a, on a man's soul when listening or when playing. And the amount of beauty that was in, in, this, in these pages of music was so staggering that I knew that at some point in my life, it should be part of my repertoire of, of my work. So this was when I was 18. And then slowly I kept reading and studying more and more of the counterpoints. Uh, I say slowly because there is no other speed at, one, at, at which one can work on this music. It requires a lot of time, a lot of thought, a lot of care, um, so that one gains a, a deep familiarity with something that is quite complex, obviously. And I had no rush 
to be honest, to to play it in a concert setting or or, or to do something with it. But I kept slowly making progress. And then there was this double coincidence of the pandemic with a total lockdown and of having just received the Borletti Buitoni Trust Award, which meant having a, a substantial budget to fund um, an artistic project of, of my own choice uh, with complete freedom. And somehow this moment of silence, of isolation, of reflection, of a lot of time without any concerts, any schedule, or any pressure, but just you know, waking up, going to the piano and practicing and then going to sleep. And then the next day, the same. This kind of suspended moment and uh, in, in a way ritualistic time became the, the perfect moment to think about what finally I can do with the Art of Fugue as well as to finish if, if one is ever finished with the work but finish learning it and being uh, at least able to perform it. And that's how I came to think of a project that I called The Art of Fugue Explored and how I finally was able to record the piece and play it in concert. Um, there's there's lots of um, interesting bits and pieces in, in, in your journey um, in The Art of Fugue. Um, one of them, a, listening to you um, explain your process is how you weren't initially in any sort of rush to do anything um, externally. Um, if I understand correctly, then it was you were you were approaching you were you were approaching the work more for very personal um, reasons. Um, were those reasons a, sort of a um, like as a mechanical um, vehicle for you to practice and, and hone certain um, uh, skills? Was it a sort of poetic, um, introspective um, vehicle for reflection? Um, was there a spiritual element? Was it a combination of all three? Could you, could you just maybe uh, give me some, some more detail into into why you were so comfortable in just simply um, um, acquainting yourself with the piece without necessarily having any any objective in mind. So it's definitely a combination of all the things uh, you mentioned. Um, so first of all, when, when practicing uh, at the piano, a lot of of my time as of course it needs to be dedicated specifically to the few or sometimes many, sometimes too many works that I have to play in within days or, or, or a few weeks of the moment that I'm practicing. Uh, so for example, if I have three different recital programs and two concertos at hand, most of my time will have to be dedicated to those. And then there is always something that's in the background and it's a more long-term goal, something that I feel when I can put time into that, it's a good, a good long-term investment. And at that time, to me, it seemed like um, I was young, I am still in a, in a way very young and uh, I felt and I still feel that the the best foundations for my repertoire and for my personality um, are the great classics, are Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert. Uh, so to have as a something to constantly fall back to when I had some free time in, in my practicing, the art of fugue, that seemed like a very natural and very intelligent thing. And it also was something that I always enjoyed. Every time I had free time from preparing concerts and from high pressure loads, I could just go back to this extremely poetic, extremely uh, in complex music. In a way, I could go back to a piece that satisfies all aspects of, of music making. 
whether it is the emotional, the intellectual, or, or the spiritual one, because indeed it is music that has a lot to do with prayer and with peace. Fascinating. Um, you uh, mentioned in your in your website. I'm going to quote uh, something that caught my attention. Um, you mentioned uh, you write the symbols and layers of meaning hidden within the work's conception are one with the moving singing that really is its heart. Um, could you expand on that? Could you sort of break that apart? So in, in my opinion, but not just mine, um, uh, the greatest works of art are those that allow themselves to be looked at at whatever level of depth and also to be questioned with whatever kind of, of question one can think of. And whatever way you look at them, they give you a, a different answer that is full of meaning and of beauty. Uh, it's not the case with all works of art, uh, unfortunately, but it is definitely the case with a work such as The Art of Fugue. And what I mean by this is if you look at it in the sense of listening to it for the first time and just seeking uh, beauty on the surface, uh, it has plenty of it. If you look at it from an emotional point of view of being able to be moved by the harmony, by the singing lines, this definitely happens. And at the same time, you can go interrogate this work about structure, about the mathematics at play with composition, about its spiritual meaning, about symbols in terms of numbers of or musical figures that are inside and what they mean. And there are secrets, there are plays with numbers, with, with, with musical figures, and each one has a meaning. And you can start thinking about what this had to do, uh, what this, this piece meant in Bach's life at that moment, and what relationship it has to other works by Bach or uh, musical theory essays or works in other sorts of, of arts or religious texts and so on and so forth. There is a limitless um, possibility, a limitless number of possibilities that one can look at the art of fugue and always uh, find something that is incredibly meaningful and beautiful. And this is why um, I, I, I say that it is a work that's filled with layers and, and, and symbols. But at the same time, a risk that is there, especially with Bach's late works, but in, in Bach's music in general, especially after the last century, is to only look at these symbols or only look at mathematics and, and, and say that that is the, the, the beauty in the piece. And I think this is reductive because it's, it's, it's like censoring the, the outward part, the, the emotional part, the singing, the, the poetry, um, basically by saying almost that it is, it is something of a lesser value that did not have an importance to Bach, whereas Bach's conception is much more organic, uh, as is uh, uh, the one of, of the greatest artists, in my opinion. And on the uh, on that subject of of the of the singing and 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 the poetry, um, when when I hear your your recording, it strikes me as as a very emotional and a very uh, sort of subtle um, interpretation of of the art of fugue, even at times almost lullaby sounding. There's, there's almost a, a, a relaxing sort of soothing, um, obviously not, not, a, not in every moment of, of all the different movements, but, but in your recording, there are particular, the, the soft moments are particularly soft and, and particularly soothing. Um, would, would you agree with, with my um, listening of your recording or how would, how would you, you, you describe your, your approach? Because obviously different, different artists have approached the, the piece very differently. How, how would you describe your, your, your approach? 
So uh, I think one of the biggest challenges with playing a work of this kind is that you look at the score and it's just the notes. You don't have any indications of tempo. You don't have any indications of expression. You don't have articulation indications, dynamics. Uh, you don't have anything except the pure counterpoint. And this is both a liberation in that I, I believe it invites you to find color, to find uh, expression, to find the right tempo, the right meaning for, for everything. And also the big challenge is that you have to look for all these things, which in, in other composers are, are given to you. Um, if you take a contemporary piece, mostly a composer write every, writes every, every single thing that you, thousands of marking for every second of, of, of music. And in, in this music, it's, it's quite the opposite. So the first phase of learning it was to learn the notes uh, in a very basic way to read the counterpoint, uh, to familiarize with it, to understand more and more in, in larger chunks, the, the phrases, the, the structure, the, the harmony and its, its journeys. And then once I finally had somehow a certain grasp of the whole one hour and a half uh, length of, of the piece. Then I had to experiment, uh, to look, to, and th there's no other way to do this than to just try and try to remember what feels organic, what feels meaningful, what, what works in, in terms of the, the harmonies, in terms of the sounds getting, working together, uh, the phrases, uh, you know, weaving themselves together. And it's something that you look for at the piano at the same time with your intellect and with your heart and also the, 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 the finger, the fingers. And the more I practiced and the more I experimented in all sorts of ways, so fast tempos, slow tempos, lots of color, very few dynamics, uh, trying to emphasize the difference between each counterpoint or trying to, to play them all sort of the same way. I experimented as, as much as possible, also in where to put the, the various canons, in which order to place them, or also in which order to play the counterpoints, since there are theories that maybe the order we have is, is, is not the, the one Bach may have wanted after all. And after experimenting like that, what I was most attracted to and what seemed to me to convey the essence of the work the most was a view where, first of all, I was imagining uh, that the work is sung by human voices, uh, sort of like a, a Renaissance madrigal, or, uh, because that kind of purity, but at the same time, extreme ability to communicate emotion is exactly what I felt was the, the right instrument for, for this piece. Of course, it's written for keyboard, but as an idea for the, the keyboard player, I think this should be the idea of sound. Uh, and that that point, uh, I, I, I still, I, I did not enjoy that much trying to constantly change the idea of, of what color the, the piece should have. Uh, somehow, I was more attracted to trying to create a very long arc over the full piece. And each counterpoint returns at the same subject, at the same tempo. And by by creating a lot of difference between one counterpoint and the other, that is not really there in Bach's writing. And what I mean by this is emphasizing playing one counterpoint extremely slow and the next one extremely fast and one very legato and one very staccato and one with, um, I, I don't know, whatever. Uh, this may create on the surface uh, relief or something that is very attractive uh, when, when listening because it, 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 it keeps going from one thing to another. But I feel it doesn't really enable 
this sense of a long journey with something that is slowly changing and morphing and goes from absolute simplicity to a, a deep prayer in, uh, in a sort of desolate place in, in time and space, which is the end. So this idea of keeping the, the ideal instrumentation for the piece in my mind the same, the kind of tone more or less the same, and the tempo more or less the same, and letting the differences that are actually there in the writing, in harmony, in counter subjects, in counterpoint, in the way each counterpoint has a different duration, this seemed to work better. And the result is, as you say, it feels very calm and soothing, I think, because of this regularity in tempo and this uh, fact that there are no extreme leaps in character. And also because I try to make every line, every note, every finger sing, uh, even in, in the counterpoints that are naturally faster. And then also I think what happens is that the proportions between the sections in the work and in each counterpoint uh, respect more Bach's wishes. So there is a, a clear uh, indication that the proportions between, for example, the first half, the first seven counterpoints and the other seven uh, are more or less the, the golden ratio. And the same thing by number of bars. And the same thing applies uh, within the first seven counterpoints between the first four and the other three. And within the first four, two and two as a couple, they are in golden ratio and so on and so on. Uh, this was a, a paper I, I read that pointed it out. And this kind of uh, proportion has a meaning and it sounds only if the tempo is not changing all the time. And in many recordings, for example, counterpoint number four is played extremely fast with a completely different uh, character from the first, probably to emphasize the, the playful nature of the, the, the cuckoo, uh, cuckoo bird uh, singing, you know, the, the jump in third. But at the same time, this makes the counterpoint much shorter in duration compared to the first. And I don't think that's the proportion Bach wrote at all. Actually, number four is a much more substantial, much longer few than, than the first. So these are were, were kind of my thoughts in, in developing an interpretation and a, a meaning for, for the whole work. Um, another question is always why playing Bach at the piano? And I would say that I play Bach at the piano because I'm a pianist. There's no better reason than that. Uh, I think uh, Bach's music can work on an incredible number of instruments. There is a kind of purity to it that makes it beautiful on almost any ensemble that can play the notes. And there is, it's like, it can have so many different manifestations in our world, but the music itself is in another one. And by listening to the art of fugue on piano, on harpsichord, on organ, on uh, orchestra or string quartet, one gets a more complete vision of the work. Uh, it was for sure, now we, we know that it was for sure written for a keyboard instrument. Uh, which one to play it with? I, I say with all of them. Uh, I, I love that we can now listen and perform Bach on all sorts of different instruments and enjoy this music in this multiple way. And with regards to ornamentation, instead, I, I feel like the, again, the essential purity of this music um, the more and more I, I, I played the piece, the more it seemed to call for an extremely simple interpretation. The music is already so complex and so wide uh, that anything that is not essential uh, takes away from it. And in this sense, 
ornaments, at least to me, at least on the piano, seem to overcomplicate in a way that didn't add any beauty. And letting the counterpoint as it is um, shine and, and, and transmit, communicate emotion to the listener, it seemed in the end the, the most effective way to play the piece. You've just helped me understand the art of fugue in a way that I've I've never been able to understand it. So now I really I'm really looking forward to listening to your recording again. Um, you've you've just articulated a lot of things that I've on some level have appreciated of the art of fugue, but it, it had never been articulated to me in quite that way. Um, in, in regards to your interpretation, you, you of course, um, decided to leave the piece in, in, its, in the version that we, that we have it, um, meaning unfinished. Um, and when I listen to, to, to your recording and that moment arrives, it always gives me the chills. It always sort of makes me feel um, in awe. And part of, part of the reason is because I can't help but speculate and wonder if Bach had in mind some, some sort of infinite spiral that never ended, and then perhaps realizing that it was an infinite spiral that has no end, played with the idea of well, what if this infinite spiral just suddenly stopped? What would that, what impact would that cause? How would that feel? Um, but that definitely is how I feel when I listen to your recording of it. I feel like in, in that arc that you've just described, um, it's an arc that sort of transmits the idea of infinity. And then suddenly you are reminded that you are in a very temporal, you are a human being on earth where things have beginnings and ends. And then suddenly from one minute to the next, infinity stops. Um, was was your was your choice to not attempt to compose that ending immediate to you from like that? Did you know that from the very beginning? Did you never even think of going in that direction, or did you at some point flirt with the idea of maybe trying to finish it like other other interpreters have? So it was not at all an immediate decision. It was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to take in, in playing a piece because, because the truth is there is no right or wrong decision. And at the same time, you really feel that you want to take the right decision because it's a big responsibility on how you are finishing uh, one of the greatest works of music that man has ever produced. I remember at first I thought that of course I could not and should not write the, a completion myself. That was never uh, a question for me. I, I do not have the skills, I do not have the instinct or the creativity of a composer to, to even begin writing something that could um, finish the Art of Fugue at, at, at a level suitable for an ending for, for this piece. But what I did think that maybe for a practical situation of a concert, you did need some kind of, of ending. And I liked the idea that the ending should not be completing the art of fugue in, style, in the style of Bach uh, with counterpoint in D minor, but it should be, uh, as sort as restorations of old buildings, uh, I like when the restoration completes the building, but you can read immediately where the the old destroyed ruined building is 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 finished, and the new part is is just completing it and help supporting it somehow. So I was very much attracted to the idea of asking the greatest com composers alive if they ever had in mind to write a few bars or a few lines of music in a contemporary language where you can clearly 
feel the, the rupture, the, the tragedy of this silence of the incompleteness of the work, but at the same time have sort of a, a connection to, to the ending um, for, a, for a performance sake. And I did ask Kurtag and Lachenmann if they were interested, willing, or would consider writing an ending. And they got very angry with me. <laughs> they got very angry with me, but uh, at the same time were very uh, kind to me. Uh, Kurtag called me on the phone, which was an emotion that I will not forget easily. And Lachenmann wrote to me by, by email. Lachenmann just said that uh, Bach's work is perfect as it is, and it's even more beautiful because it is unfinished. And that no one should touch it. Nobody can, can write anything that is comparable to this uh, immense treasure in music. And then he also said, if I ever die, don't you think about completing one of my works or asking someone else to complete any of my works. <laughs> Um, Kurtag instead suggested either one of three ways to, to, com to finish a performance of the work. One was to go back to the first counterpoint and so lead it back into the simplicity of the beginning. Another was to take a chorale of my choice uh, not necessarily the one that is published in, in the first edition of The Art of Fugue, any chorale that I feel strongly about and offer it as sort of, of a prayer at the end of this journey, at the end of this work. And the other was to keep at least two minutes of absolute silence. And in the end, that was the way I chose to complete the work. Uh, when you stop and you physically stop and hold this silence for as long as an audience is able to keep silent, then all this mystery, all of the tragedy, but also uh, hope that is in, in included in this silence is, is able to, to, to make an appearance in the concert hall. Also, people have time to slowly go back to, to the terrestrial world after this very much uh, extraterrestrial experience or celestial experience. Also to think about what they just heard, to take a breath and absorb all of their own thoughts and meditations that were inspired during the last one hour and a half of, of listening. And somehow also I think that this long silence and the fact that the work is unfinished is an invitation to everyone that comes after Bach, so us and future generations, to go forward, not so much in completing this single work, but any sort of uh, artistic expression or of scientific achievement of whatever way uh, one has to, to keep progressing the, the ability of mankind to produce beauty and uh, and understanding and knowledge and so there is a lot to this silence and in the end keeping it and holding it as long as possible was the most effective way uh, and i agreed with both lachenmann and kurta in the end it's it's interesting that later on uh, much after i asked them to maybe complete the work. I, I did go play uh, the work for, for Kurtag in Budapest and had a lesson with him that was quite inspiring on, on how to look for even more music in every detail of, of each counterpoint. And uh, also I was able to send my recording to Lachenmann who who did end up enjoying my playing and not being so so furious at me as, as he originally was. <laughs> the uh, 
That explains then the those 13 or, or 15 seconds at the end of your recording um, are quite deliberate or, or not. I, I, I think it was at least 40 or 50 seconds. Okay, no, then, then, you're, then you're right. Then, then, it's, then it's 40 or 50. Um, that silence uh, first caught my attention um, because obviously well, one of the problems with, with uh, listening to, to um, classical music um, uh, in our day and age is that if you're listening to it on a streaming service, then you are very easily taken out of context and you go from one thing to another um, very abruptly. And it's, and it's a very, very uncomfortable feeling. Um, and I was listening to you recording. The first time I listened to your recording was on, on a streaming service. And I realized, because I, I, when, when I know that's going to happen, I usually jump to my, to my computer to stop it before it goes someplace else so I can, I can absorb what I just listened to. And then as I, as I was going, I realized that it wasn't going anywhere and that the, the recording was, was still, was still uh, streaming. And then I sat back and let it go until the very end. And I thought, wow, he let it, he let that silence. He, he must've really have wanted that silence to ring um, because it, because it doesn't happen in, in, in other, in other recordings. And I thought, wow, that is, that is absolutely remarkable. And, and now I understand where that's coming from. Um, where did your decision to work with, um, with your, with your producer, with Martin Sauer come, come from? Was that something that you chose uh, very, uh, again, very deliberately? Was it suggested to you? How did that relationship come about? So compared to, um... Uh, other recordings I made before with the Beethoven sonatas. Uh, for this one, I could use a slightly bigger budget because I had the support also of the Borletti Boitoni Trust. And I knew many CDs recorded in the Teldex studio, uh, and especially piano CDs, and they had a wonderful sound to them. And so I knew that that must be a good place to, to record. And especially Martin Sauer, uh, I mean, all, all of the uh, uh, Tonmeisters at Teldex Studio uh, are incredible. Somehow um, I was very attracted with the idea of working with Martin Sauer. I felt like he would naturally find the right recorded sound for the way I play Bach and the way I play this work. And actually it was exactly like this, uh, an experience that never happened to me anywhere else where I was just trying out the piano at the beginning of the recording session, which was four days long and trying playing Bach, uh, whatever. And he was, you know, assembling microphones, trying out sounds. And then he said, would you like to listen a bit and tell me, I think this is the sound you want. And I go and I listen and it was exactly the sound I wanted for the recording. And that kind of, of intuition uh, it, it is, is an art in itself. And he certainly was able to, to display it. Uh, the sound that he created is created, that he recorded uh, uh, from, from my playing is one with very little attack of, the, of, 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 of each note being played. So that is, a, it has very little percussion. It is able to sing and play legato uh, extremely effectively. It is never harsh. Uh, it is very clear and very harmonious in the way the, you know, the different harmonics of, e, of each note can blend together. So all in all, I felt it was exactly the, the kind of singing poetic inward expressive sound that I wanted for the Art of Fugue. So I must thank Martin Sauer again for the work he did. It definitely, it definitely comes off that way. It's a very, it's a very expressive sound. Um, and when I was, when I was looking over your website and I had seen that you had recorded it with him, I thought it was, I, I was, I was excited to listen to it because we, I, I knew his, his other Bach recordings and they're, and they're, and they're all pretty uh, spectacular. Um, so the recording is 
again, as we were sort of commenting at the very beginning, the recording is just one aspect of the Art of Fugue, uh, your project. And most, uh, most musicians, most, uh, most uh, performers would, would have left it at that a few years ago. They would have been very happy to have had the opportunity to make um, a recording of the Art of Fugue. But you've taken it much, 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 much further. So um, what is exactly how you conceive the, this network, this constellation of, of the Art of Fugue? I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm referring to, I, I feel like there's a dialogue that you are very clearly trying to um, weave together between the different mediums that you're that you're um, incorporating into into the project. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? So in a way, I feel basically the center is the art of fugue. The center is the work, and that is what I would like people to be able to access, to be able to listen to it to enjoy it, to feel uh, all of its power and its beauty. And uh, somehow I had the realization that different people may need different points of entry into a work of art, different keys. And so the idea was, you know, to create a sphere of content, of uh, reflections, of, of all that I could create around this work so that one could enter at different points in different ways and maybe find their own path towards the center, which is the work. So the center of the project is playing the art of fugue, playing it live to audiences, um, illustrating it in concert lectures, and also having recorded it. And at the same time, I, I, I thought, what else can I do? And a, a first big realization, which is still, I think, the, the, the leading part of, of the rest of the project is, let's see what, what some great people of today, great artists, great thinkers, uh, great minds who love Bach's music, what would they see in this music? Let's ask them what helps them listen to it, what's, what helps them understand it, what similarities it has with their work, whether it is architecture or mathematics or the visual arts or cinema, um, to, to try and ask what is for each of these people their own key that unlocked uh, their view of the music of Bach? Why is it so important in in them, has it inspired their work? And so, you know, this started a journey, uh, first of all, of thinking who are 14 people, one for each of the fuse in the art of fugue, that I would like to know from in today's world. How do you, do you see Bach? What do you see in this music? How would you try to get someone else to listen to it? And I started thinking, I started researching in different fields of culture, of art, of diff different instrument uh, musicians from all uh, different instruments, composers, uh, string players, keyboard players. And slowly I, I came to a list and uh, started writing. And my big surprise was that some of the people I most admire in today's world actually answered to me and most of them actually answered enthusiastically uh, and agreed to take part in, in this project. And we still haven't finished filming all of it. Uh, it has proved to be more difficult and uh, take more time than I imagined. Uh, this is also the first time I did anything with video um, or with trying to get a someone to publish the, the final product uh, is something that takes more time to get an agreement on than I hoped for or imagined. So, but the journey is still ongoing. 
we have filmed to this date eight of the conversations and each one has been incredibly different and incredibly meaningful to me. It, it has meant meeting some of the people I admire the most, uh, talking to them, uh, exploring different aspects of Bach's music with them. And each has a very individual, uh, special, sometimes such a simple view that it can be almost surprising. You would expect them to come, come at you in a very intellectual way. And actually instead they reveal a very simple way of thinking and enjoying Bach's music. And my hope is that on the whole, when I can probably finally publish these 14 interviews, they create a network of associations uh, that people can make with between Bach's music and different fields of culture. And then maybe at the end, someone who enjoys mathematics will listen to the interview with Marcus de Sautois and uh, de Sautoy and, and, and see what, what he as a mathematician sees in, in Bach's music. Or maybe the, an architect will look at the interview with Frank Gehry. Uh, and when Frank Gehry says that when he designs, he only listens to Bach's music because it is the one that has the, the kind, this kind of thinking of, of an architect, of putting blocks together in a way that is geometrical, but builds something that is completely organic and meaningful. And maybe someone who is interested in dance uh, will listen to the interview with Sasha Valz, a contemporary dancer, and, and so on and so on. Each of them explores different things. Uh, I try to to ask questions that would uh, draw the most out of each uh, guest in, in this series. And I'm looking forward to see what kind of reaction people have from these. I'm sure the, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, I can tell you that I'm on the edge of my seat waiting for this to finally, finally come out. Um, I'm sure that your your audience and a wider audience will find it very very interesting. In in hearing you uh, describe your choice of um, of guests um, of of, uh, of interviewees, I can't help but wonder if if you knew if you consciously knew that you were um, finding the universal elements behind Bach's music or sort of exploring the universal elements in Bach's music, um, especially now that you mentioned um, uh, Frankie Gehry. It, it, it seems, and, and it, it was one of the things that I, I, I was curious to talk to you about, um, but, but hearing you describe that, that network of, of people and their approaches uh, to, to the art of fugue, what's, what's fascinating uh, to me is that it is something that is very universal. And uh, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are as to why it's universal. In the sense that, how is it that Bach's music can be interpreted or felt through architecture, through dance, through poetry, um, through music, of course, etc. Any 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 thoughts on that? Why why is it so? Why is the art of fugue so universal? In that sense, I think all of Bach's music and his later his later works, especially, have this characteristic of feeling very universal. Mostly because Bach's personality was a very uh, universal one. He was extremely curious. He was knowledgeable and interested in all sorts of, of fields. And somehow in writing his music, he was not, I think, trying to express a particular detail of, of something, but to come to a sort of, of universal truth, to, to come to a music that would in a single piece somehow include and represent everything that was in, in the universe or in God's mind. And since this was his research, 
to go not in the particular, but as much to the roots of, of music, of art, but also of the human being and the universe as possible. This is why, you know, from the roots, you can always lead back in to any sort of ramification and still feel a connection. If you take other composers, um, I don't know, uh, I, if I think about Debussy preludes, which already represent a single image or, or, or kind of atmosphere and situation, this is a completely different kind of art, not less or, or more in, in any way. But this, for example, I feel has, has more of a limit when you try, if, if you try to uh, make Debussy's preludes relate to architecture, you would feel like they, they don't belong together. If you tried to take uh, Debussy preludes and make them relate with religion, they, they are so much more specific. With the Art of Fugue, you have this open score all in one key, and it does feel so universal almost as to become neutral, as to become some sort of lens through which you can look at anything else. And the, the reverse it also applies, which is that from anything else, you can look back into the art of fugue. That's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the most fascinating things, as you say, about, about Bach's music, especially his, his later pieces. Um, and it's, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, ask you about a little bit later. But um, one of the things, when I hear you talk, Obviously, in, on the website and in other um, interviews, you've, you've alluded to it, but I'm very interested in your own personal background. Um, you just mentioned Bach's uh, personality and his interests in, in multiple fields of, of human knowledge, culture, and thought. Um, but you seem to be coming um, from a very sort of similar place. You're, it seems to me that you're clearly not only interested in music, you, you clearly have other interests. In, uh, uh, just by looking at the, uh, the the website for the art of fugue, you you chose to write poetry as preludes for for each for each movement, um, and your interest in finding these other uh, people that you admire, etc. Um, I know from from a few interviews that you that you've mentioned that your father is a physicist, um, and I believe it also a musician, if I'm not mistaken. Um, can you share a little bit about your, your personal background and maybe how that impacted you um, and how that's developed and come across in your own art and your own work? I'm sure it's, it's not as interesting as studying Bach's background, but I'm happy to, happy to share. Um, I come from a small town in northern Italy, close to Milan. My Parents are both nuclear physicists, and I have an older brother who is a mathematician doing his doctorate right now. Um, for sure, my, my father also studied piano when he was uh, young, but then stopped when he entered university. For sure, the, um, the mixture of a scientific background and kind of mentality that runs in, in my family uh, as well as the education I, I received in terms of school, uh, attending uh, a high level high school um, with a focus on scientific subjects. But uh, in, in Italy, we also study uh, a lot of philosophy and art history and liter literature history, even in, in the most scientific high school. And at the same time, uh, the strong Catholic faith in my bringing and in my family. I, I would say that probably these components all came together in who I am today also as, as an artist. And surely they influenced why uh, I would choose a piece such as the Art of Fugue, since it seemed to reflect all of these things. Uh, the interest in science and in mathematics, not so much. Um, 
I feel the thing that I that appealed to me the most about mathematics in particular is that in the end, the kind of talents one must have to, to really understand and appreciate the aesthetics of mathematics are the same as a good musician. You need to be able to perceive a long structure as a whole, going from one point to another, uh, as, as you would in a piece, uh, the same way you need to perceive a, a long proof of a, of a theorem. And at the same time, understand in a very detailed way the single links and how they work together to keep the structure together. And a capacity for abstraction and huge fantasy, which people don't seem to understand in, is involved in mathematics, but actually uh, ma good mathematicians are some of the most creative people on the planet and in history. Uh, much more than many artists, for sure. Somehow, um, also studying literature and poetry and uh, learning about philosophy, all of these things uh, while growing up left a mark on me. And now as a pianist, I, I chose very happily with no regrets to mainly make music and music at the piano the focus of my life. But I would like to, to keep a link to all of these interests. And in a way, this project is the first time I was able to do so in a, in a very concrete way. So not just in my mind as sort of uh, an affection or an imagination or aid in, in interpreting a piece, but actually uh, delivering something uh, to, to people out of, uh, out of all this background that is always in my mind somehow. So yeah, I would say that's that. <laughs> it's it is a very interesting background. Um, whenever whenever I've had opportunity to travel to to Italy, um, one of the things that is most overwhelming and one of the things that's most beautiful is is the um, the amount of churches and the art within churches. Um, and now that you you just mentioned a a, a catholic um upbringing um are are the aesthetics the designs the 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 art that's found within within churches is is this of any interest to you at all or 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 is it something that's just sort of always been there in the background and so it's not something that you particularly notice in especially in italy especially no, no, I would say it's a strong interest. Uh, I mean, uh, being a, a, a concert artist now, I've had more than ever before the possibility of seeing basically every major city in Italy and performing in it. And being able to visit the, the cathedrals, the churches, the abbeys, the museums with hard art from any century it has been one of the most powerful sources of inspiration for me in, in these years. Also, having studied this, uh, the history of this art in quite, uh, I would say, high level of, of detail in, in high school, because I had a fantastic art history professor, uh, made it possible probably to go into a church or a museum and, and know what I'm looking at. Uh, or at least no, no more than than I would have otherwise. And and in in that sort of in that sort of vein in that sort of sense um, regarding your your education, I am assuming that you are familiar with uh, with Dante and uh, La Commedia. Is that would that be correct? Familiar with a work of this magnitude. It's always a scary word to use, <laughs> but we do study it extensively in school, and I try when, whenever I can to go back to it uh, and at least read again uh, a few of the canticles. Is that how you say it? The it is, yeah, in English, it's canticles, yes. Well, I, I ask because um, 
I don't know if if you you've ever explored um, or the, or if you've ever if you've ever been exposed to the mathematical and the systematic um, construction behind uh, behind La Comedia, but in in doing some um, some background research in, in preparation for this for this conversation, I realized that there is a surprising amount of similarities and overlap in how um, both Bach and Dante um, approached the the the, the creation of their of their masterpieces of their of their work in general um, with a very systemic with a very mathematic um, um, framework and also with the uh, numerology and the and, and and using numbers as symbols using math as as symbols is this anything that you that you've ever come across that you've ever heard of or or anything that you could uh, share? um uh, regarding for sure the divine comedy is one of the other great works of art that you can read at surface level or any other level of depth and they and it always gives back something um, and dante is one other artist in, in history that i would define as completely universal uh, the presence of mathematics sometimes to a visionary degree in the divine comedy is something quite staggering uh, i remember even uh, a paper by a, an italian astrophysicist that noticed that the way dante structures heaven sort of paradise uh, in his imagination he is basically describing uh, a sphere in four dimensions which is a theoretical concept that at the time was not in mathematics, was not even thinkable. Nobody had thought about expanding geometry to a fourth or higher dimension. But Dante imagined intuitively in the sense of meaning um, a space that, that had to represent uh, God and heaven and described in the end something that is impossible in three dimensions and, and is actually realizable in, in four. And that is, you know, when art and prophecy and premonition somehow anticipates uh, the ability to rationalize, it is always something e extremely interesting. Uh, for sure, there are similarities in, in Dante and, and, and Bach. Uh, I don't feel that I know enough in detail uh, Dante to to speak too much at length uh, about these. Uh, uh, and I would not want to make mistakes and <laughs> say something that is not true. But for sure, the use of mathematics, both in the construction of the work of art and in the, the way of thinking, the presence of philosophy and spirituality, as well as uh, extremely colorful uh, writing and expression, uh, this organic conception of the universe where everything belongs together somehow is, is definitely something the, these two great uh, humans had in common. And, and I think one of the one of the things where where, where they coincide is in this sort of um, universal um, conception of time. And and I noticed in your in your own poetry, in 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 many of the the preludes that you that you wrote, you you reference time. And I I'd, I'd like to just sort of read out loud a couple of excerpts, and and just um, ask you for for some background into into uh, what they might what they might mean. Um, this one is from eleven, and it says. Vision turns clear through the unbearable pain that's told for miracle. We are past and future gather at some point of a time that is not time. Time's fabric will be twisted, looped, and torn, and will be lost, and perhaps all will be new. Um, it's beautiful, and it has, it has that um, sort of articulation of, of what one perceives 
that time might be in Bach's mind when he's composing uh, the art of fugue. Um, but I'm interested in your thoughts. Where, how did this poetry come about? And um, in, in particular, this, this one part about time's fabric will be twisted, looped, and torn, and all will be lost, and perhaps all will be new. Could you expand on that a little bit? So first of all, to go a little bit behind, um, I, I enjoy poetry a lot. And since I was maybe 12 or 13, I occasionally try my hand at writing something. I never thought about publishing anything. Um, when writing a booklet to the recording of The Art of Fugue, I was thinking, what should I write? What should I write? Um, and my impression is that so much has been written about this work, so much. You can Google it, Art of Fugue, and find thousands of papers and monographies and big books. And, um, and somehow this still hasn't, uh, the, this amount of information and this kind of information has not led people to be at a wide, uh, in, a, in a wide way at least, uh, curious about the art of fugue uh, or to come to know it or inspired to, to listen to it. And what I wanted to do was to write something that enhanced not so much the history, the background or the, the science behind the art of fugue, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's poetics, uh, it's poetry, the fact that it is full of inspiration of questions of, of doubt and, and uh, you know, suggestions of, of visions, images. And so I started trying to write a, a few poems and at some point it became clear to me that what I was writing could serve as a, in, a, in a way as a sort of prelude to each counterpoint. And in writing the, the prelude, I chose sonnets as a form, free sonnets, because the number of lines in a sonnet is 14, which is the Bach number and the, the number of the counterpoints in the art of fugue. And for the canons, I chose a very geometrical and synthetic form, which is the haiku, which is just three lines with five, seven, and five syllables. Then with the, the sort of general, in terms of language, what kind of language, what kind of uh, world should it uh, bring us inside? I was thinking very much of the quartets by Eliot. And one line in each of the sonnets is taken from Eliot's quartets, just quoted. Um, why? Because these are works of poetry that have the idea of counterpoint inside. They are quartets in the sense that they are four lines of four voices weaving a narrative or, or an, a, a world together. And they reflect on exactly the same topics that I feel are at the center of the art of few, which are basically time, man, and God. These three, uh, and, and when we think about it, these three topics are in fact the most universal. They are the ones that, that, that hold everything else together. It is ourselves and our relationship with God through time as we live. So when I feel that the art of fugue is a lot about time, it's, it, I cannot give her a totally rational uh, argument as, as to why that is, but my feeling is this constant return of the same subject, this slow development of one thing that over a long arc morphs and by itself generates a very complex journey. Uh, it is somehow a long meditation and it feels like a, a big suspension in time when you listen to it. Also for me, it feels like in an hour and a half of music, he compressed the, the, the voyage of, of existence from the Genesis to the book of Revelations. That the ending is inspired by the book of Revelations is, is 
quite clear in terms of symbology in the composition itself. Uh, the number seven occurs, the first subject is symmetrical, implying alpha and omega. Um, the structure as under, as um, uh, the, the way Zoltan Gunch uh, showed, the structure is the same as in the choral fugues by Bach that had text coming from the Book of Revelations. So that th there is this imagery at the end is quite clear. Uh, and the, the, the beginning should be the, the Genesis, I, I think is also quite understandable or relatable at least, uh, because it's coming from nothing and from one simple uh, melody, the, the main subject, it's able to create everything as if just putting one thing in existence is able to trigger the existence of everything else. And so the fact that a, a, a piece like this, a piece that is about creation, that is about, um, that is filled with symbols that come from the world of religion, both uh, Christian and uh, Judaism, that this should be about man, time, and God seemed quite natural to me. And then in each uh, of the sonnets, I tried uh, to condense a mixture of um, first of all reflections and ideas and images that came to me from playing and listening to these pieces as well as things that I knew were of inspiration to Bach when writing the piece and also the image that I took from, from Elliot uh, quartets that seemed to somehow uh, bring the same kind of atmosphere as each single um, counterpoint. And these images I also used as titles for each of the episodes in the interview series with the different people. So it's sort of like images from Elliot that sort of can act as a title to each counterpoint in a very loose way and not rigid or, or anything. Going back to the excerpt that uh, you chose, counterpoint 11 is one of my favorite counterpoints in the art of fugue. It is, except for the final one, the longest and most complex. Uh, it, its harmony is extremely chromatic. It is somehow the uh, first peak of the journey and then you come down a little bit and then you reach the end uh, after the mirror fugues and uh, the, the last canon. And somehow what I try to describe with, uh, with, with those uh, lines that, that, that you chose to read, uh, first of all, is the idea of time as a fabric, which comes from physics. You know, the idea that matter and time are, are dimensions and that you can imagine as a sort of fabric that can be modified, stretched by different forces and, 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 and changed. And sometimes I feel that when playing the art of fugue or we're listening to this music, but this is just a feeling, it's like we are observing time from a separate dimension that is not time. Sort of in, in physics, you, would, you could imagine like a fifth dimension, not even the fourth because the fourth is time. And if you were able to perceive uh, things in, from the fifth dimension, you would look at the other four, the way that we look at our three and, and see them concretely uh, as if you are outside of them somehow. So when I say at some point of a time that is not time, uh, the idea is exactly that you are suddenly outside of the dimension of time and observing it from something else that you don't know how to call it. And it's, it's still a dimension. And when you reach this, you start seeing that time's fabric is not linear, but it can be twisted in knots, looped, uh, or even torn. And seeing this and understanding this and feeling this maybe um, can, can change everything and suddenly 
all is lost, all that you knew is not familiar anymore, is, is, is meaningless almost, but also maybe everything can be new and redeemable. Um, and this goes very much into Elias Quartet's with the idea time present and time past are not perhaps present in time future and time future uh, contained in time past. And, and that's the point of, of entry of, of these poems. And these reflections on time's nature, uh, I think help very much in finding the, the right atmosphere of thought for the art of fugue. I, I, I certainly feel myself when I listen to the art of fugue that um, I am listening to timeless time, if that, if that contradiction makes any sort of sense. But um, it, it definitely seems to me that there is, when you just described that idea Oh, uh, that concept of a, of a fifth dimension where you can see time just like you would see anything in a, in a, in a, in our three dimensions. Um, that's, that's sort of how I feel when I listen to, to, um, the art of view, I sort of feel like I can finally understand time, um, precisely because it isn't linear, everything that happens in, in that arc that you that you keep referring to, and I, and, and I find it a very interesting way of referring to, to the art of you, that sort of arc that morphs over a, uh, a certain period of time, um, because of the way that it's constructed and the mechanics of it, feels like it is not time um, at all. It feels like it's completely outside of time. Um, and when you when you when you mention the 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 reference to um, Bach uh, or rather Bach's reference to biblical narratives um, and using um, uh, numerical structures and symmetries to to express that that story, I found I found that very interesting. I, I actually had not heard that before, um, but it definitely adds another layer of of interest to it. Um, for for myself um and I'm, I'm just curious to and we don't have to get into any 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 details about it but i am assuming then that even for that for yourself when you when you uh, approach the art of fugue um there is an element of faith of, of your own personal conception of faith in your performance of the music would that be correct oh i would say for sure yes um, um Maybe not so much in a in a rational way, uh, but in an in instinctive, perhaps in a subconscious way. Um, the way I've grown and where I'm, uh, where the point I'm at in in my personal way to live, uh, faith or religion or spirituality. Uh, enters necessarily any any work I play, but there is none that has so much resonance with this part of, of my soul as uh, the art of fugue, at least currently. Who is your ideal audience for for your your project? And and I know that might sound that might be either a very stupid question or or a very difficult question, but who who is that ideal person that you that you see um, exploring all of the multi-dimensional and multimedia aspects of your project? To me, the ideal audience is just any person who has a open heart and open mind and open ears to listening. Um, and this is, it, it doesn't matter the amount of previous knowledge or information or how used people are at listening to classical music or whatever. Um, what I, if I could, what if I could choose an audience I would be seeking out is more of a disposition to, to listen. And 
this is all that one can really ask from, from an audience. Uh, in the end, in some way, making music for someone else is mm, uh, like a, a confession that just is looking for uh, another soul to listen with empathy. And then the magic of, of musical art can, can happen when this happens. So for me, the people that I hope will be interested in listening to the interviews or listening to my recording or coming to a live concert or lecture or, or listening to this conversation that we are having now, I just hope that those people will be people who feel that something is, is missing and that the, the direction to look for that something in their life could be the art of you, could be box music. And when there is this instinct, uh, and when there is a will to be open, to listen, then everything else follows. When, when, um, when you think of the world, the, the uh, sort of the industry of music that, that you are now uh, very much well established in um what do you what are your thoughts regarding um younger generations um exploring music with this sort of depth that you're exploring exploring the art of fugue and and uh, what are your thoughts regarding the industry's ability or desire to to support to to finance to invest in in this sort of depth This is a complicated question. Um, first of all, my general perception of today, to today's world in general, is one where in, in each individual's life and as, as a civilization globally, the balance between profundity and uh, banality has been tilted very much towards banality. And what I believe is that in each of our lives, there should be a balance so that we're not all the time praying in a monastery or meditating in a desert or whatever. We, are, we can also enjoy a, a dinner out or seeing a, a, a simple action movie or whatever, but there should be a balance. There should also be deep uh, experiences of art or spirituality of aesthetics of, of whatever and I don't think today globally there is a balance I think we are very much tilted towards uh, entertainment where everything has to be entertaining it has to be immediate it has to be simple direct and probably uh, it, it should not be conveying a, a deep message or, or any message at all and this is I feel the, the biggest danger and the biggest thing lacking in, in today's culture. With, when we talk about younger generations, I think my generation uh, and also the, the ones younger still are most uh, victims of, of, of this because uh, we have incredible tools at our disposal, but which encourage at least for now uh, immediate gratification towards uh, long-term uh, uh, and, and deeper, more complex uh, experiences. That is why I feel that as a balance to this, actually, uh, when younger people have an occasion to have a deep experience, they, they are completely blown away by it. They are completely attracted to it. They feel like suddenly there is something that they didn't know could exist and that is giving them a, a shock and a, a meaningful. And when, when this kind of surprise and encounter can happen, uh, it's really, for, for me, for example, if I play a concert for uh, an audience of school children or uh, high school students or whatever, and they come to me at the end and they say, can you please give me the, the title of that piece that you played because I really need to hear it again. It's, 
for me, it's an incredible point of satisfaction because there you feel that the message you were sending was received. And I don't feel that young people are unable to enjoy this kind of music or this kind of experience. I think they're just born and raised and mostly surrounded by an environment that rarely puts them in a position to encounter deep experiences. And if you have rarely encountered them, you even don't know how to look for them or how to seek for them. And, uh, and people, at some point, they, they try, they go out of their way to seek deep, meaningful experiences, oftentimes uh, finding even dangerous things when looking uh, in the wrong places. So this is why going forwards, I would love if it were possible to make to make the whole industry, as you call it, uh, of classical music, more about giving people deep experiences than emulating what is happening with every other uh, genre of music. And I have a, a bad feeling that for now, that is the direction we are taking, that uh, we are uh, making even classical music more and more superficial. Uh, that the people, that a lot of people who are in, in the industry, not all, not probably not even the, the, the majority, but uh, somehow the, the industry itself or the, the markets or whatever, the economy, I don't know, is making even classical music go generally towards a, a direction where we are encouraging uh, shorter pieces and uh, less challenging works and uh, different attire on stage because it creates more variety or more show or all sorts of uh, innovations that I don't think are really innovations but just distractions. Whereas we should be aiming in, in, in the contrary direction to emphasize the, the core of, of each piece. And depending on which work you're playing, that will be a, a different thing. For example, one thing I would love to do personally, and I'm trying to set up a project for, for this for 2025, is instead of con continuously playing concerts uh, on for one day in one city and then going somewhere else and doing something else is to stop for one month in a city or a longer period of time and, and do much more. Uh, much more means you can play your concert or your concerto, but you can also go play music for uh, university students or school children or in hospitals or in jails. You can teach local musicians. You can do uh, chamber music evenings in more informal venues. You can go play outside the main city where uh, in small towns or uh, disadvantaged, disadvantaged neighborhoods, there are never any opportunities to listen to this music live and so on and so forth. If you stop for a month in a city, uh, you have a chance of leaving a deeper mark on the city, on its culture, and also of having, a, of receiving a, a deeper meaning from the city and its community. And this is something I would love to see the world of, of music tilt towards. Um, I don't think today the world or, or music needs artists to be shooting stars, conquering thousands of cities every year, uh, but rather it, it needs, as musicians to be willing to, to interact, to re rebuild um, an attention towards this kind of experience, towards this kind of, of search uh, that is somehow lost. And so rather than being, you know, shooting stars that appear, get an applause, play a concert, dazzle, and then leave. Uh, I feel very strongly that 
we should think about structuring concert seasons in a different way. Which would be a, a, a wonderful, a wonderful thing to see um, on a, on a related sort of uh, note. Um, my, my final two, two questions. Um, one is when do you think we can finally see all of the art of Fugue, the project completed? Uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier that there are, are logistical issues and, and other things that have um, obviously, uh, obviously take time. Um, do, you, do you think we'll be able to see everything that you had in mind um, by, the end of, by the end of this year, perhaps? So I'm very hopeful that uh, the interviews should be published starting in September. Uh, the rest, there is an idea to try and explore uh, a film, making a film. And I'm, I've been talking to a, a director, an Italian director that I uh, love very much. Uh, but that will definitely be something even more long term, uh, if it ever happens, uh, because it's much more complicated thing, especially in terms of, of thinking. How do you create a whole film without just being illustrating the art of you, which needs no illustration? or without being, uh, you know, taking away from such a, an immense piece. Uh, so that I have no idea uh, when and if it will finally happen. And then I had an idea that I wanted to build a, an app for this project, meaning uh, an app that would allow to listen to all of the material that I produce in, in a single place and to collect some texts, essays, my poems, whatever, to create one location that one can hold in, in the smartphone, which is today our most intuitive way of accessing anything and, and make that a portal into the art of fugue, if possible. Uh, Depending on how much funding finally I, I will receive, because the current budget would not allow for that, I may be able to do that. So let's just cross fingers that everything works out. So, so it sounds like the art of you, your your project is it, it might actually turn out being a sort of lifelong thing. It might just grow um, with time. It isn't something that you would necessarily um, want to finish and publish in, in one year or two years, but rather something that you might be coming back to. Is that, is that correct? Or do you want to, or do you want or, to just, at some point you want to just leave all of this behind and, and move on with something else? No, for sure. I imagine this piece being a cornerstone of my repertoire and of my work uh, from now on. Uh, for sure in the next three or four years, I will keep presenting it as often as possible in, in recital, as well as keeping working on the project. But I'm sure there will be other periods then in my life where I will return back to Bach again and again in a reaction to what is happening at the moment or, or just again, when I feel that the moment is, is right to to go back to this piece or another Bach piece. Who knows, maybe in 20 years, I will do a big focus on the Goldberg variations. <laughs> thank you. Filippo, thank you very much. Thank you very much. All the best in, in Orléans. Um, and um, I hope that we can stay in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Till next time. Till next time.